In the 5th century, Britain ceased to be part of the Roman Empire and its economy crumbled. 200 years later, a new and very different kind of currency appeared. Unlike earlier Anglo-Saxon coins, this currency was made of silver, and thousands of specimens have been found by metal detectorists across England. It represents the start of an economic revival in England and its neighbours, but the source of the silver behind this coinage has long been a mystery. Now, new research based on laser ablation analysis has shown that these new coins in the former Western Roman Empire were based on the riches of the Eastern Roman Empire, often known as Byzantium. That was where the silver used for rebuilding the currency of Northwest Europe came from. I've been interested in early medieval coins for a long, long time now, and it's always been clear that the late 7th century, the beginning of the 8th century, was a time when lots was changing, when there were many, many new coins starting to appear, lots of places issuing them in large numbers. But the question always was, where is the silver coming from to handle all of this? And I didn't have a good answer. Nobody really had a good answer. And so when um, fate dealt me the hand of COVID, and I had this conference, which ended up being a lot more affordable than I expected it would be because it had to go online. We had the good idea during the conference itself of using some of that extra funding to set up a, a mini project with my two colleagues from, from Oxford and Amsterdam where we would look at the silver content of coins from that period, silver coins from that period to try and get a better handle on where that silver is coming from. I'm very fortunate to be working here in Cambridge where in the Fitzwilliam Museum they have one of the world's leading collections of medieval coins which is incredibly broad, incredibly rich and which included a very large number of coins from exactly this period. So from just one collection close to home we could get exceptionally good coverage. And so that was really step one. We, we contacted the museum, we arranged to be able to do this work with them which was a, a huge privilege and then we decided which coins we would look at. And we did the work itself in two steps. We went just down the road to Earth Sciences where we started the first round of what's called laser ablation analysis. And this means essentially you, you zap a tiny, tiny part of the coins with a very high powered laser. And what comes out from the area which is affected by that laser tells you what is inside the coin. So it's a way of finding out what the content is, but by causing minimal, minimal um, invasive harm to the coin. And by doing this, we were able to see how much silver there was and how much there was of various other elements. And that balance between these different elements can tell you where the silver comes from, what its original character was. A while after this, we did a second round of laser ablation analysis using a, a portable laser ablation kit, which uh, my colleague brought over from Amsterdam. And we did this just in the other room here in the Department of Coins and Medals. And this involved taking the coins, again, uh, subjecting them to this, this laser analysis. And the results we got from this told us about the lead isotopes within each coin. And by this, we mean different atomic varieties of lead, which are, are and the balance of those differs depending on where your silver is coming from. And so by combining those two sets of information, the elemental information and then the lead isotope information, we got a really, really good picture of what was going on inside these coins with their silver. We already knew from the thousands upon thousands of finds of these things that have been turned up by metal detectorists that there was a big economic change going on in the late 7th century. Far more of these things were being made, they were being used far more widely and almost certainly by lots of people. So there's a big change in how people are doing business, how they are transacting with each other. And this is being supported more and more by coinage, which suggests that it's more complex, it's deeper, it's dealing with more people, probably other commodities. The question that we wanted to answer in relation to this was how that came about. What is it that's, that's pushing this forward? And so what we discovered was that the silver came from the Eastern Mediterranean. It almost certainly had been present in England already because we know there was very little trade or other direct contact with the Byzantine Empire, the former Eastern Roman Empire, which is where this is coming from in the Eastern Mediterranean. And so it suggests, therefore, that this silver had come in at some earlier point and then been stockpiled. So people were sitting on big piles of this stuff underneath their beds, in their attics, and there are changes in the late 7th century which encourage them to take it out, turn it into coin and do something different with it. For example, at Sutton Hoo, 
in this enormous Anglo-Saxon burial from the early 7th century, there was about 10 kilos worth of Byzantine silver. There were plates, there were dishes, there were spoons, there was a whole dinner service worth of, of stuff in this, this ship. And if all of that had been melted down, it would have produced the equivalent of about 10,000 of these small silver coins. What we can see is that as you move into the middle part of the 8th century, the 740s, 750s, this economy of silver pennies based on Byzantine silver starts to drop off. They're simply not making many coins by that stage in most of England. Things do pick up as you move into the later 8th century, the era of Offa of Mercia and Charlemagne. We can see that at this stage, they're now dependent on silver that's coming from Western France and not from the Mediterranean. It's coming mostly from a place called Mel in Western France. And this was uh, a mining complex which was becoming more and more important in the course of the 8th and 9th centuries. It was the major source of silver within the Frankish world, and Charlemagne is pushing it forward. He's trying to use male silver to jumpstart a big reform of his own currency in the 790s, and this seems to have been a big force in why it becomes so dominant in England. They simply don't have any other source of silver, and they're now able to take it in from Francia instead. One of the main legacies of this is the penny itself. The silver penny remained the baseline of the English monetary economy for almost a millennium after this. And of course, we still use pennies now. That goes back directly to this transition that you can pinpoint in the late 7th century when the silver penny becomes the, the standard denomination in the English coinage. Um, this also, I think, shows very well how Britain is not an island. The English kingdoms are not able to source everything they need within Britain, they are always looking around more widely for how they can get silver, how they can get other commodities. Things are very interconnected, they've always been very interconnected, and this new information about the silver shows just how economically interdependent different parts of Europe have always been and continue to be.